is on uh, the schedule and on the bottom of the forms in case you guys need me. If there's ever something you guys need, question, feel free to give me a call, okay? I'm really happy you guys are here. You guys are going to have a great weekend ahead of you, okay? Thank you so much. Thank you. Welcome everybody. <clears throat> I'm so glad that you could put the effort into coming down for this weekend. It's so nice to see some familiar faces from previous weekends. <clears throat> for those of you who have been here before, uh, forgive me if uh, some of or most of the lecture is familiar to you. Um, you understand that I can't really change too much because it's so important for people who haven't heard it to hear it for the first time. <clears throat> although I don't think it's exactly the same, since I don't read out of a book. Um, <clears throat> let me give you uh, an overview of, uh, of the weekend, so that you can understand why it's important for us to start with this. Before I do, though, I didn't get around to meeting everybody during the reception, and I want to make sure I can put names or faces and uh, family members with our patients. Um, you are, oh, yes. Course. Just tell me um, the uh, first name of your loved one, uh, and I'll know who it is. I know all of you. Brittany. Uh, oh, welcome. Hi. <laughs> Great. And I, I heard Cameron, yes, so you must Cameron. be the girlfriend. No, I actually come from sister-in-law. Oh, your sister-in-law. Yes. Oh, his brother from Nick? No, unfortunately, he had prior engagements that could Oh, I'm going to smack him. So, <laughs> step mom. <-mounting. laughs> yes. Welcome. Ah, that's it. Hello? Hi. Hello? 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 Good. Can I sit there with you? Oh, yes. Tom. Oh, welcome. Oh, I'm so glad you could come. And I'm here to see Lockie. And your relationship? Uh, I'm a child with a child. Great. Good. Um, From my two books. <laughs> Jessica. These are so that I can see the business. <laughs> Jessica. Yes, I heard you were coming. Of course, you've come a long way. Yeah. After I, yeah. Yeah, losing my throat because I scream at the patients all the time. <laughs> She's <pretty tired. laughs> She wins the award for having been screamed at the most <laughs> ever. <laughs> Four and a half years at both retreat. I kicked her out of the program three times. She's bouncing back. But now she's doing it beautifully. It's such a pleasure to see. <clears throat> and um, uh, those of you who are new will, will learn about that process and how we go from severe psychopathology, psychopathology, disease of the psyche or the mind, how we go from severe psychopathology to a healthy brain and how to recognize that brain as being healthy. So today, <clears throat> Um, I will teach you what normally takes four years of medical school, four years of residency in psychiatry, and a year of fellowship in addiction psychiatry on top of that. I'm going to teach you all of that in four hours. You need to be experts in psychiatric disease if you are going to know how you're going to play a role as part of the treatment team. I was mentioning <coughs> to someone earlier that uh, I practice in uh, private practice, solo private practice, all by myself, in an office, for 18 years. It's extremely difficult to treat psychiatric illness in that setting. The statistics show that 50% <coughs> of all patients in all specialties, internal medicine, OBGYN, surgery, <clears throat> do not fill the prescription that they get when they go to the doctor. 50% don't fill it. That's a non-adherence rate. Of the 50% who actually fill the prescription, one-third take it as prescribed. 
How successful do you think we're going to be in treating any illness with those kinds of findings? In psychiatry, it's much worse, much, much worse, for many obvious reasons. I started the treatment program because I saw that so many of the severe illnesses, schizophrenia, bipolar disorder, severe personality disorder, and addiction, cannot be treated effectively in that setting. They don't follow direction. They don't follow recommendations. They don't take medicine. They don't report to me the truth about what's going on between sessions. I don't have you there to keep them honest. In this type of community setting, they can't get away with too much. We monitor everything, especially in PHP, partial hospital program, that highest level of care. <clears throat> also called residential uh, treatment. Yeah. We create this cocoon, a very contained environment where we are monitoring the patient 24 hours a day. We miss nothing, almost. They teach us how to be more and more keen in our observations. <clears throat> I'll teach you more about that. So, early on we also discovered that we couldn't really provide optimal treatment without you. We learned that if they had access to you, for instance, during the first few days of being with us, the likelihood of them leaving prematurely was through the roof. They just had to hear your voice, and that immediately stimulated them to start thinking, I don't need to be here. I don't need to be in this structured environment. When I was home with Mama, I got to do whatever I wanted to do. She had no control over me. That's the illness talking, the diseased part of the brain that's creating those kinds of thoughts. And of course, they act on them. So it led us to institute a general rule where we try our best to not let them have contact with you during that first week of treatment. The other piece to that is that coming into a new environment naturally stimulates all sorts of emotions. Now remember, you know them, we don't. We have to get to learn about them. We have to get to know them as quickly as possible. Let me just go off on a tangent for a moment. Remember, we're constantly under pressure to get them well as quickly as possible. Primarily because most of your loved ones are being um, treated <clears throat> and paid, treated by us, but we are paid by the third party insurer their insurance company. And they want them out in two days. We call on admission to give the clinical information to get the authorization for treatment, and they, if we're lucky, if we're lucky, we'll get four days of PHP authorized up front. Call back, let us know how they're doing. We're probably going to force you to drop them to intensive outpatient. Crazy, crazy. But we fight, and we fight, and we fight. And we appeal <clears throat> in order to prolong the time they're at the appropriate level of care. So the clock is ticking from day one, from minute one. And we have to get to know them. So we discovered that if we not allow them to have access to you, then all of those emotions that get stirred up just by virtue of coming into a strange environment will not get expressed to you as they normally would, but get expressed to us. So we get to learn about them more quickly. <clears throat> That's a, a nearly impossible concept for the person coming through the door to understand. And you'll understand by the end of the lecture why that is cognitively. All of the cognitive deficits that are associated with most of these psychiatric illnesses, they don't get it. So it's a struggle right up front. Argument, fight. You can't tell me what to do. I'm out of here. I'm going across the Taco Bell and calling my mother. Kind of thing. You'll hear more about that throughout the weekend. <clears throat> so that's, um, that's where the pressure is. After learning about all of these psychiatric illnesses, and by the way, I mentioned addiction as being one of them. I will convince you, if you don't already accept that, that not only is addiction a psychiatric illness, but addiction is a brain disease. 
plenty of evidence now, which means that the approach needs to be different. We used to think, even when I was in, you know, when I was in medical school, in the um, early 80s, <clears throat> we essentially taught that substance use was a social problem. It had nothing to do with medicine, medical illness, medical disease. People chose to drink too much. They chose to use cocaine. They chose to use heroin. But we've come a long way now since medical research has shown the results of drug use or alcohol use on the brain, and you'll learn more about it. So back to you and how you need to learn how to be supportive. A lot of the things that you would normally do when you're raising a healthy individual, we want you to do just the opposite. When you are needing to provide support to an unhealthy individual, sometimes it makes no sense whatsoever. But you, by the time you leave on Sunday afternoon, it will make sense. And if it doesn't, then you'll stay until you understand totally the nature of every intervention we provide and the rationale. So today you'll learn the foundation, <clears throat> the basic science. And tomorrow you will see in our community meeting how the power of the group begins to change the individual. We focus a lot on behaviors. Behaviors are the expression of brain function. It's what you obviously see in other people. <clears throat> and most of the illnesses that I'm talking about are expressed through behavioral symptoms or behavioral signs. By the way, a sign is something that we see. A symptom is something you complain of. A headache is a symptom. A rash is a sign. You'll learn more about that. I'm going to teach you a lot of terms that I need you to remember. And we'll come back to them, and you'll see expressions of the illnesses and apply the appropriate terms throughout the weekend. So tomorrow, uh, you'll get an experience of, that is um, uh, consistent with what we provide on a daily basis. We have a <coughs> community meeting led by me every morning, Monday through Friday. <coughs> and my goal is for everybody in the community to learn not only about themselves, but about how they're relating to everyone else in the community. Because it's the nature of the relationship that reveals signs and symptoms of the individual's illness. Many of these illnesses, particularly addiction, but the severe personality disorders, bipolar disorder, and schizophrenia often, drive the individual to engage in what we call sociopathic behavior. They break the rules. They lie, cheat, steal. You will learn, I'm giving you a preview, of how, what the mechanism <coughs> is. Why is it that people with these illnesses engage in those behaviors? <clears throat> I'm not gonna answer that right now. You'll know the answer by the end of the session. I'm sorry? Oh. Am I upside down? Is that better? Okay, thank you. But they're recording. Yeah. <laughs> oh, by the way, um, a number of you in past uh, family weekends, after hearing this lecture, they say, do our loved ones actually get these lectures? Do they learn all of this? Do they understand what they're doing to their brains? Everybody comes in, almost everybody, comes into treatment with significant cognitive deficits. Verbal memory deficits, visual memory deficits, executive function deficits, judgment impairment. What we've learned is that we have to titrate 
the amount and sophistication of information that they're able to handle. You know, we, we teach them what they're capable of learning and watch that improve over time. Um, <clears throat> we've wanted to do some <laughs> different experiments, though, so that we could learn uh, whether they should be attending this lecture, for example. And, of course, all of us realized at the same time that that would be a disaster. And, and, and we have open discussions with your loved ones about this kind of thing as well. And they all agreed that it would be a disaster because they would be focusing on you and you would be focusing on them and nobody would be focusing on me. <laughs> so we came up with a solution and that was to have the lecture filmed and now for the first time sometime uh, next week they're going to sit in a room and listen to at least parts of the lecture and we're going to sort of test um, what they were able to absorb and know whether you know we're wasting time at the PHP level or should we wait until they get into uh, the transitional living at maybe a higher level like level three or level four. <coughs> we'll talk more about community uh, at the end of the lecture. Tomorrow afternoon um, there are a number of different presentations giving more specific detail about different aspects of our program. Tomorrow evening, as Jackie had mentioned, you have an opportunity to have lunch, uh, have dinner rather, uh, with your loved ones at the restaurant. You'll be able to have lunch tomorrow um, here after community, also with your loved ones. We're monitoring everything that's going on, the interactions between them and you. They've been told by me that they're not allowed to ask you for anything, and you're not allowed to give them anything. You're not allowed to offer them anything. You can't let them look at your iPhone or to use the phone or to look at an iPad or to use an iPod. Nothing whatsoever. They've also been told that if you offer something to them, they have to raise their hand immediately so that staff will recognize that and come to you and find out what unhealthy choice has just been made. And you, in turn, are to raise your hand if they ask you for anything during your interactions with them. So, let's see, Paul's parents. Paul said to me, so what are we supposed to talk about? I said, remember what I am teaching you about brain function and the reasons you came into treatment, the nature of your psychiatric illness. You're going to talk about how you've come to recognize what are signs and symptoms of your illness, and learned about your treatment. We're looking at mood regulation, judgment, cognitive function, anxiety tolerance, impulse control. You're going to talk to your families about how all of those functions have been impaired, and in which way, and how you are responding to treatment. They're going to be very excited about that. I said, I'm going to teach them what that all means, so they'll be able to understand what you're talking about. They all thought that was a, a good thing to focus on. So it's up to you to ensure that that's the kind of thing they're talking with you about. And of course, you can give them some information about your lives and what's been going on in your homes, which for the vast majority of them are no longer their home. So catch them in their language. You know. Again, Paul mentioned something about being home. And I said, who's home? He said, oh, oh, my mother's home. I said, that's right, you don't have a home. You. you will all learn more about that uh, tomorrow. <coughs> okay, uh, <coughs> and then on uh, Sunday, we get together again, and we get to <coughs> address in, in more detail um, how what you've learned today and what you've witnessed and experienced tomorrow actually translates to the treatment of your individual loved one. And, and we, we look more specifically at your loved one's pathology and their response to treatment or lack of response in some cases, and the role you may be playing in either helping or hindering that process. Uh, so that by the end of the weekend, you know exactly what your role needs to be. And you'll see for the um, people in IOP and OP, <coughs> um, for those loved ones, rather, 
their families, you, when you're on that call on Tuesday night, it'll have so much more meaning to you. The discussion will have much more meaning to you. <coughs> Same for Wednesday night, the PHP call. You'll hear new families come in, come on the call, and they'll be asking questions that, that you now recognize are naive and due to ignorance, and, but you're educated and you'll be able to help them to understand the rationale for our crazy interventions and why we're being so mean and why we're depriving them of food and water. <coughs> Not exactly, but sometimes you hear that. All right, um, so the most sophisticated organ in the body, the brain, <coughs> seems like a relatively simple structure, uh, but it's extremely complex. This outer layer of the brain is called the cortex, and I'm just going to stand this way to orient you. So this is the front of the brain, right here, back of the brain. <coughs> you will learn that um, <coughs> different parts of the brain subserve different functions. So not only are there layers to the brain, but there are individual structures within the brain. We call this the frontal cortex, the occipital cortex, the temporal cortex, the parietal cortex, those different cortices subserve different functions. The most sophisticated and the latest from an evolutionary perspective <coughs> is the frontal cortex, particularly the prefrontal cortex. That's responsible for what's called executive function, the ability to plan organize, <coughs> to be able to predict what's likely to happen with certain choices. In fact, it's responsible for judgment, that capacity to predict what the likely consequence of one's choice is going to be. A car's coming down the street. If I start to cross the road now, I will make it to the other side without getting hit. You're utilizing that part of the brain. It's severely impaired in most of the psychiatric illnesses. <coughs> Occipital cortex, responsible for vision. Parietal cortex, responsible for sensation. Temporal cortex, responsible for audition or hearing. Gets even more complicated than that, and I'm just going to give you an idea of what that looks like. <coughs> different functions in different parts of the cortex but we're going to go deeper. <coughs> the first illness that I want to discuss and we're going to spend the most time on because it's the most prevalent is addiction. Addiction as a brain disease. To use as a choice, a man walks into a bar and slowly alcoholism tears his family apart. Is the man truly deciding to do something that is going to result in this awful consequence? You have to start questioning what choice means. Now, <coughs> let me start getting a little more complicated with regard to parts of the brain. I talked about the prefrontal cortex. The frontal cortex is just slightly above and behind that. Down deep, there's something called the anterior cingulate cortex. That's involved in decision making. We know, and I'll show you evidence, that that's impaired in, al in addiction. <coughs> the ability to make a decision, I already told you that judgment is impaired. The ability to predict the likely consequences of a decision, affected by addiction. A more formal definition, addiction is a chronic, meaning once you have it, you'll always have it. Relapsing, comes and goes, episodes. It's a brain disease characterized by compulsive drug seeking. The person is driven to seek out drugs. Driven by what? You will learn. And used despite harmful consequences. That's a key phrase that's really <coughs> is probably uh, one of the most significant signs in diagnosing addiction rather than simple social use, for example. The person with addiction continues to use, even though bad things keep happening as a consequence. They don't learn 
from the experience. That's an impairment. It's not their fault. <coughs> Let me uh, get a little more complicated in that addiction is a primary chronic disease of brain reward, motivation, memory, and related circuitry. Okay, <coughs> translating in this into how is it a disease of the brain? Well, <coughs> we know that there's a part of the brain involving a number of different locations within the brain, including the ventral tegmentum and the nucleus accumbens. If the nucleus accumbens is stimulated, we experience pleasure. Another way of saying that is that, that everything that gives us a sense of pleasure could be food, sex, water, relationships, leads to the stimulation of the nucleus accumbens. All drugs and alcohol stimulate the nucleus accumbens. In fact, <coughs> they stimulate the release of a molecule called dopamine. All result in dopamine being released in the nucleus accumbens, resulting in the feeling of euphoria or pleasure. So that system, from the ventral tegmentum to the nucleus accumbens, is changed in this thing we call addiction. Memory. Memory is very complex. There are different stages of memory. We have short-term memory, long-term memory, working memory. I'm hoping right now that I'm putting information into your memory. What I'm doing is actually stimulating something called the hippocampus. And the hippocampus is formulating these memories. Actually, the neurons within the hippocampus are being stimulated, and they're strengthening the connection. And that's what the memory is, by the way, a strengthened connection between neurons. Tonight, while you're sleeping, in fact, during rapid eye movement sleep, there's movement of the memories from the hippocampus to the frontal cortex. Long-term memory is here. <clears throat> that process is impaired in this thing we call addiction. Dysfunction in these circuits leads to characteristic biological, psychological, social, and spiritual manifestations. This is reflected in an individual pathologically pursuing reward and or relief by substance use in other behaviors. So, think about <clears throat> walking into the woods finding a blueberry, blueberry bush, it's July 23rd, 80 degrees, you're in upstate New York. You pick the berries, you eat them, they're perfectly sweet and delicious. You've just stimulated your nucleus accumbens. Now, with that stimulation, you've also stimulated your hippocampus. You've created a memory of the experience you just had. A memory that is probably going to stimulate you to return to that bush the next day and repeat the experience. It's basic learning. We have a positive experience. We've connected it to a memory system so that we can use that in the future. We learn from our own memories, from our own experiences. So now we want to repeat the positive experience. This is the basic structure, the structural system by which addiction is created. An individual is exposed to a substance that leads to the stimulation of the nucleus accumbens and a memory is formed. Wow, that felt good. I want to do that again. And again. And again. Now, in the person with addiction, that starts to stimulate changes in the brain. And I'll show you what some of those changes are such that now only the substance, only the drug, will create that experience. A great meal doesn't give that kind of sensation. Sex doesn't give that kind of sensation. Nothing else, only the drug. That's addiction. We say that addiction hijacks that motivation reward system in order to maintain it itself. <clears throat> this is a um, uh, criteria for substance use disorder 
um, that was used in the um, <coughs> in psychiatry, we have this manual called the Diagnostic and Statistical Manual of Psychiatric Disorders. And there have been a number of versions. We're now on version five. Of course, it has to evolve over time as we um, gain new knowledge about psychiatric illness and change our classification system. There are certain diagnoses in psychiatry today, for instance, that we didn't have 20 years ago uh, because research is revealing whether or not um, a certain diagnosis is valid or not is valid rather. <coughs> Substance use disorder criteria, I'll just, uh, I won't go through all of them, just to give you an idea of what some of them are. So it's a problematic pattern of substance use leading to clinically significant impairment or distress as manifested by at least two of the following occurring within a 12 month period. Um, the person's using substances often in large amounts over a longer period of time. Uh, there's a persistent desire or unsuccessful effort to cut down. A great deal of time is spent in obtaining and recovering. There's craving, there's recurrent substance use resulting in a failure to fulfill major role obligations, etc. All describing, in essence, you know, how the substance use has affected the individual's functioning. If there's no effect, and I teach the medical students as well as the patients this all the time, You'll notice in the criteria, if you read through them, it says nothing about quantity. You know? Somebody tells you they're drinking a gallon of vodka a day. Are they alcoholic? Do they suffer from addiction? Has nothing to do with quantity. If there are no negative consequences, if the person's function is not changed in any adverse way, if medically, perfectly healthy, that guy isn't suffering from addiction. Tremendous resilience, you know, iron stomach, but not addiction. Hmm. <coughs> On admission and periodically while the patients are here, um, we test the urine to see, first of all, on admission, to see what they've been using most recently and then subsequently to help deter them from, you, from uh, relapsing while they're in treatment with us. This is just a list of uh, some of the drugs that we test for. Um, many opioids, you've heard of some of them, codeine, morphine. Hydrocodone is uh, Vicodin. Um, oxycodone has been very popular for a long time. Uh, fentanyl, the benzodiazepines, um, you know them as Ativan, Valium, uh, <coughs> Librium, Xanax, uh, the stimulants, others such as uh, ketamine, barbiturates, uh, alcohol. Just a word about alcohol. Um, <coughs> if you take a drink of alcohol and you give a urine sample, it'll show alcohol in the urine up to just a few hours after use, then it's gone. Somebody could use and then we test them 12 hours later and it's negative. So we think they haven't been using. And that was a problem for years. <laughs> Until a couple years ago, it was discovered that <coughs> there is a, a, a molecule in the blood that is formed when people drink, and that's called ethyl glucuronide and um, its partner molecule, ethyl sulfate. They are found in the urine up to five days after last alcohol use. So it's very difficult to hide that one. <coughs> These... Um, Molecules are found in the urine, though, uh, as a result of any alcohol exposure, which means if we had an, <laughs> we had an individual who um, was cooking for herself and, uh, oh, she had bought a frozen bag of shrimp scampi. And we didn't know that. On routine testing, we saw that she was positive for ethyl glu glucuronide, so we addressed it as a community. And, of course, she swore up and down that she didn't drink. She did not relapse. She had tears in her eyes. Okay, but you have to account for this. You're still responsible for accounting for this. And we teach all of the patients, by the way, that because they know this, they have to read ingredients. We had someone else who was positive for ethyl glucuronide because she had bought um, uh, some type of Dijon mustard that had white wine in it. Well, there was white wine in the shrimp scampi. <coughs> they have lists on their refrigerators in transitional of all of the common 
grocery items that they need to avoid because there's at least a trace of alcohol. Purell, hand sanitizer, mostly alcohol. If you rub your hands with it, you will produce a positive ethyl, ethyl glucuronide. I always have trouble with that word. <coughs> so you have to be very vigilant when you're suffering from addiction of what to avoid. <coughs> uh, methamphetamine, cocaine, marijuana, metragenine, kratom. Let me say a word about that. Um, kratom is very unknown in this country, despite the estimate that approximately 30 million Americans are physically dependent on it. It's from a, uh, a leaf of a tree in Southeast Asia. In fact, it's illegal in Thailand and a couple other Southeast Asian countries. It's perfectly legal in the United States. It has stimulant and opioid properties. People can get hooked on it just as easily as they can get hooked on heroin. Abrupt cessation causes a withdrawal syndrome that looks like opioid withdrawal from heroin. In fact, the same medicine we use to treat heroin withdrawal, we treat kratom withdrawal. Very serious molecule. <coughs> the DEA has investigated the possibility of making it illegal. There was a, 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 um, a local uh, agent from the DEA office who interviewed me about it, actually because we've treated a number of people in our program, <coughs> gathering data in order to see if they had sufficient evidence to make it illegal. And I just heard recently that so far they're, they're just choosing to table it, that they're, they're no longer investigating it, which really shocked me um, because to see people become dependent on it and then the withdrawal syndrome is it's tremendous. <coughs> You can buy it uh, in um, kava bars. They're most commonly found, a kava bar. Now, kava itself is a, a mild sedative, also legal, and they make teas out of it, or various drinks. You can buy it, and um, you can have them add the kratom to it. It's been a problem for a, a few of our patients who've come in never having taken kratom before. Uh, they learn, uh, learn about it, and then at a vulnerable time, um, they may stop in and have a drink and then we discover it. Uh, we've only been able to test it over the past one and a half to two years. The uh, synthetic cannabinoids, all these JWH molecules, <coughs> we have a natural cannabinoid system in our brain called the endocannabinoids. Anandamide is a molecule floating around in our brain that stimulates those cannabinoid receptors, playing a role in many different functions of the brain. Now, when someone smokes cannabis or marijuana, they develop all of those common experiences related to cannabis. But cannabis, in cannabis, the active psychoactive agent, tetrahydrocannabinoid, THC, is a partial stimulant at that receptor. A partial stimulant. And some people are vulnerable to the effect such that they become psychotic when they smoke marijuana. We've had a number of patients present with psychosis, having only used marijuana, no other drug. Partial stimulation of that, oh, that uh, cannabinoid receptor. The synthetic cannabinoids are full stimulants at that receptor. Very, very serious effects. Often psychosis, seizures, and death. We've had a number of patients here, <coughs> um, one of whom had a seizure, others have become psychotic when exposed to synthetic cannabinoids. Yes? Sorry, what are the names of the synthetic cannabinoids, like the street names? Spice. Oh, spice. Yeah, the most common name. Uh, there are others, but that's the most common. Uh, let's see, of course, heroin and fen PCP, angel dust. <coughs> Why do people take drugs? To feel good, to feel better, to do better? you know, to do better. We're uh, affiliated with six different medical schools. So we're under the microscope a bit. I love that because it forces us to maintain high quality, high standards. <coughs> we have um, medical students generally from uh, the third year of medical school, fourth year of medical school, sometimes first and second year residents 
who are uh, learning psychiatry specifically, all do rotations through us. They, they spend um, generally a month with us on a rotation. So uh, for the third year medical students, if they don't go into psychiatry, then this is the extent of the psychiatry training they get for their entire careers. So I was talking with the three who just left. Um, they ended their month yesterday, and the new group starts on Monday. <coughs> and we were talking about um, some of our patients who have attention deficit hyperactivity disorder, ADHD. And some of you know that the treatment of choice is a stimulant. And then uh, when we're talking about ADHD later, I'll, I'll tell you more about the stimulants. Well, in talking about the stimulants, the student said to me, you know, um, it's very common among the medical students to use these to study. And I said, wow, medical students. I, I heard that it was becoming more popular in college, but medical school? And they said, yeah, yeah, you know, we don't get tested. And I thought for a minute, I remembered when I was in medical school, I didn't get tested. But I would think now that drug use is so much more prevalent that medical schools would be testing. In fact, their estimate, now of course, the three of them denied using any. <laughs> their estimate was that 80% of their class regularly uses Adderall. Shocking. <laughs> That's right. <laughs> so what's the problem? Well, tolerance in that vulnerable individual. Now, you know, <clears throat> half a bottle of wine is no longer doing the trick. Got to drink the whole bottle. Now two bottles. Now three bottles in order to get the same effect. Dependence or withdrawal. Stopping the substance abruptly creates this uncomfortable withdrawal syndrome. A loss of pleasure overall and dysphoria. Dysphoria is like a chronic sadness. And you'll learn the biology in a moment uh, why that happens. Additional problems, inability to consistently abstain, can't stop. Impaired behavioral control, craving, diminished insight, you know, lack of awareness, dysfunctional emotional response. So I mentioned various parts of the brain. There's a deep part of the brain right in the center consisting of many different structures. It's collectively called the limbic system. The limbic system is responsible, in part, for regulating emotions. If we, no, I'm not going to go there. That'll get too complicated. Um, but emotional regulation is something that's impaired as well in addiction. <clears throat> One specific part of the limbic system is called the amygdala. The amygdala is what immediately is stimulated to warn you of impending danger. Something in the environment is about to happen and your amygdala turns on quickly in order to start a whole sequence of events throughout the brain to prepare to deal with that danger. The regulation of that amygdala is impaired in addiction. It's been changed by chronic exposure to the substances. <clears throat> if you look down at the bottom of the slide, on this side you see the healthy heart. This is a PET scan showing activity. The red means normal activity. This is the diseased heart. You can easily see that part of the heart is not working as well. You know, there might have been a heart attack, for, for instance, and the heart, which is a muscle, and needs blood to function. A heart attack is when you're blocking one of the arteries, the blood can't get in, so there's no oxygen to the, that muscle, and it dies. <clears throat> That's what you see here. By the same token, if you see the healthy brain, and this is if this, the positioning of this brain is if I'm lying down like this, and this is the top. <laughs> so that's the prefrontal cortex I told you about, responsible for judgment, executive function, planning, organization. <clears throat> that's normal activity, the yellow. This is the person who's been using drugs. You see the spotty activity in the prefrontal cortex. In that person with that vulnerability, being exposed to the drug has impaired brain function. The part that is responsible for predicting the likely consequences of one's choice. <clears throat> if that lack of activity were occurring 
here in what's called the motor cortex, my right arm would be paralyzed. You would not think twice about <coughs> accepting that I could not raise my arm. You would not look at me and say, raise that right arm. Come on, I know you can do it. You would accept. It's impossible. That part of my motor cortex has had a stroke. It's not functioning. There's no activity there. I can't raise my arm. But you're expecting this person to make a healthy choice. Ain't going to happen. So, <coughs> again, the top of the screen being the front of the brain, this position. You see, the limbic system that I told you about regulates mood, also regulates anxiety, <coughs> normal activity. This is the person with Alzheimer's dementia. You see the spottiness beginning to lose that normal activity. And this is the person with methamphetamine use. Worse than the person with dementia. Yes, please. Um, what's that image? Uh, this is a, uh, th these are PET scans. PET scans? PET scans. PET. PET scans? Positron emission tomography. PET. It shows activity. Um, I, I'm, thank you for asking that question. I forgot to point that out. <clears throat> uh, most of you know what an x-ray is. Just a picture, black and white, shows structure, no activity. CAT scan. <clears throat> little different technology, but still only shows structure. It's like a, um, a still picture. We have an MRI structure, but w with a little more um, a resolution. We see a clearer picture of the structure. A PET scan shows activity. So <clears throat> you're injected with a dye that attaches to the oxygen. Um, well, actually, the oxygen is... Uh, has a, a fluoride um, atom attached to it that will light up in the scanner. So as the blood is moving throughout the brain, carrying the oxygen, you see activity. The more active a part of the brain is, the more oxygen it's going to require, the faster the blood flow is going to be through that part of the brain. Shows activity. So you s we see function in the PET scan and function in a functional MRI. <coughs> now, on admission, I told you that we see cognitive deficits. How do we know that? Well, we do computerized cognitive testing, neurocognitive testing. Your loved one sits there at the computer with Jill. You'll meet Jill um, uh, this weekend. She is the director of the cognitive testing, and um, she'll give instructions about how to complete these simple tests, and she's monitoring to make sure that they're being done accurately, and they are looking at these specific domains of cognitive function only. Verbal memory, visual memory, processing speed, executive function I defined earlier, psychomotor speed, reaction time, complex attention. This person with addiction, who's 22 years old, performed this way on admission. Low across the board, some very low. Um, <coughs> you would not hire that person to work in your grocery store or your department store. He would constantly be forgetting your direction. He would not be able to complete three or four tasks in a row. Very severe dysfunction. This is a typical presentation on admission. This is the same person five months later. Five months later not 28 days. You see significant improvement in visual memory, executive function, complex attention, verbal memory, still very low. This person is going to go to the store intending to buy a dozen of eggs and a gallon of milk because you instructed him to. He gets to the store and he says, what else besides eggs? Won't remember. <clears throat> five months later. This is someone with addiction and ADHD. 
severely impaired, 22 years old. Now, ADHD causes cognitive deficits. So is this due to ADHD or addiction or both? Well, we treat from admission. This was one month later. You start to see a reversal of those cognitive deficits, significant improvement. <coughs> you see even complex attention has gone into the average range. Why? Because we started stimulants upon diagnosing the ADHD. Thinking pretty strongly that ADHD is playing a role, it would be unethical to withhold treatment just to see how the results uh, come out a month later. That's what I was going to ask you. If a patient comes in who's an ADHD patient, while they go to withdrawal here and so forth, they're still getting their ADHD medicine. <coughs> it's a great question, and it's very complex. Um, uh, let's see. I could, I could spend four hours alone answering that question, so I'm going to try to do it differently. <laughs> you play a, he a very helpful role at that, in that scenario, because many people who come into treatment say they have ADHD. That means nothing to me. First of all, um, they often confuse that with difficulty concentrating. Well, all of the drugs and alcohol cause difficulty concentrating. A major culprit, by the way, is, is marijuana. <coughs> but often what has happened is that they've gone to a doctor they describe their difficulty concentrating. They leave out the marijuana piece. The doctor says, oh, you have ADHD. Writes a prescription for medicine. So now, going forward, he or she presents to every treatment facility, I have ADHD. Hmm. Uh, we ask you, was your kid hyperactive as a child? How did he do in first and second grades? Was he the class clown? Was he out of his seat constantly? Did he get great grades? Was he the teacher's pet? We ask you those questions. You don't develop ADHD at 22. If you don't have it by 12, that's a, a recent change, by the way. For years, we thought that you had to have it by seven. But research since then has shown that there are people who are determined, predetermined by their genes to develop ADHD may not really show symptoms until they're 8, 9, 10, 12 years old. Mm. And it's clear at that point when they're evaluated that they um, have ADHD. So if you tell us, oh yeah, he was a hyperactive kid, he, he, he needed to take medicine, we gave him the medicine, um, and then he did beautifully as long as he took the medicine. When he came off the medicine, he did poorly. And by the way, kids with ADHD have a higher risk of developing addiction, not by virtue of the medicine, but by virtue of the risk-taking associated with ADHD hmm, when they get into adolescence. If you give us that history, then okay, good. That makes it easy. This person most likely has ADHD. Now, what's the risk of not treating it? Well, part of the syndrome is severe impulsivity. The risk is we're not going to be able to keep them in treatment because they have to act on impulse. I want to leave. I'm out of here. Boom. No thought, because if it's untreated, then their prefrontal cortex is not adequately stimulated. They're not going to think about the likely consequences of their choice. They're out the door. So that in itself is reason to treat them. Treat them as soon as possible. Help regulate their impulse control. But do you treat them with a stimulant when people abuse stimulants who suffer from addiction? That was a research question, actually, for years. It's still controversial. What I have found is that our patients do exceptionally well taking stimulants while they're in treatment with us. We control the medicine. 
Um, there were times that we've had a couple of episodes in the past where the person who's supposed to be taking the Adderall or Concerta or Vyvanse um, managed to cheek it and give it to somebody else. Um, but that type of thing has been rare. Most of the time we find that when they truly have ADHD and, and stimulants are the most effective treatment, we have a couple other medicines for ADHD that are not nearly as effective. We give them the stimulants, they do well. The concentration markedly um, improves. Uh, <coughs> certainly their attention, their impulse control, which then puts them in a position of being better able to benefit from addiction treatment, all the other components of addiction treatment. So it ends up being most effective. What we don't know is what happens after they leave us. Do they continue to just take their medicine as prescribed, not abuse it, not give it to anybody, not sell it? We, we d there's no way of us knowing that, yeah. <clears throat> uh, this was someone with schizophrenia and addiction on admission. Two months later, you start to see improvement. Now, he's being treated with an antipsychotic uh, for the schizophrenia, and also he's receiving all of the other components of treatment for addiction. So, you know, what's responding? The the psychosis was responding, certainly, and psychosis can also contribute to cognitive deficits. <coughs> this was someone with only schizophrenia, no addiction on admission, actively psychotic on admission, and I'll explain that later, what that means. Um, and this was <coughs> two months later. You see her significantly responding already. This is just an example of some co a cognitive exercise. Um, after we identify the cognitive deficits on admission, then we prescribe, actually, the specific types of cogn computerized cognitive exercises that the individual will engage in, generally 20 to 30 minutes a day on a daily basis, specific to their deficits. So if they've had verbal memory deficits on admission, then we prescribe the, sp the specific types of exercises that have been proven to improve verbal memory deficits, etc., for each of the domains, and then we follow them over time. By the way, um, all of this type of thing, cognitive testing, the cognitive enhancement, or the cognitive exercises, that was all started in the um, programs that that treated traumatic brain injury. TBI, uh, traumatic brain injury, um, usually causes significant cognitive deficits. And rather than accepting that there was just nothing we could do, um, a lot of research was done, and this is going back probably 20 years, and <coughs> uh, it, it, many, many of the people who are, who are tested um, cognitively were found to improve with various interventions. And then over the years it became computerized and standardized and now um, used routinely in that population. <coughs> From there, people who researched schizophrenia adopted it after identifying that in schizophrenia, or schizophrenia itself, causes many significant cognitive deficits. And so now there's a whole research literature showing the benefit of people with schizophrenia undergoing cognitive enhancement. Is just a little bit of research starting to be done looking at using cognitive enhancement in addiction. We're the only program I'm aware of in the country that's actually doing it on a clinical basis and not just in a research laboratory. Uh, and we've been doing it now for, uh, I'd say, a year and a half or so. Um, and we see significant improvement across the board. <coughs> 